In previous video, we introduced the concepts of game theory through the example of the prisoner's dilemma. In this video, we're just going to apply these tools and concepts a little more generally into more and different games. The first question is, you know, what's the usefulness of the tool set and concept of game theory when we're thinking about environmental natural resource problems? And the answer to that is when decisions are strategic, which kind of what I do depends on what others do, which is often the case in issues with environmental problems and externalities. Economists often use, an, sorry, analyze behavior using those concepts of game theory. We begin with some important solution concepts in game theory. The first is Nash equilibrium. There we have a picture of, of John Nash. And again, you can think of equilibrium as kind of a state, state of rest, right, where a convergence uh, in this case of decisions. And the definition of a Nash equilibrium is a set of choices for which no player wants to deviate, given that the other's decisions do not change. Nash equilibrium concept, at least on its face, is simple, but it does require some thinking, right? The idea is something is a Nash equilibrium if, given that everyone else doesn't change their decision, you don't want to change yours. And that holds for all players. All right. Now, a dominant strategy, very simply, is an optimal choice for a player regardless of what the other player chooses or what the other players choose. So this is something I'm going to do no matter what. And if everyone has a dominant strategy, then there is one single Nash equilibrium in which all players play their dominant strategies. To illustrate these concepts, Nash equilibrium, dominant strategy, let's return to the prisoner's dilemma. We have prisoner A here on the left, prisoner B, and first thing we need to recognize are what are the decisions or the choice set, stay silent or think, for each prisoner A and B, and the payoffs. Each parenthetical statement, each statement in parentheses here, has the row player, in this case prisoner A's payoff first, and B's second, and right, so that's B's payoff. And again, this negative 20, for instance, is 20 years in jail. This would be zero years in jail when you go free. And so if prisoner A stays silent and prisoner B thinks we're in this parentheses payoff, prisoner A would get 20 years in jail. Prisoner B would go free. And as long as we keep that in mind, we know how these payoffs work. Again, prisoner B is considered the column player. Prisoner A is considered the row player. And the next thing we want to do is remind ourselves or introduce how you solve these games. And the way to do that is put yourself in one of the prisoner's shoes, consider what the other prisoner would do and what your best response would be, and then flip it. So let's start. We're going to put ourselves in the shoes of player A. So we're prisoner, sorry, prisoner A. And prisoner B can either stay silent or think. All right. So let's think about if prisoner B stays silent. Now we're in this column. Well, prisoner A, given that prisoner B stays silent, we don't know what's going to happen, but consider that that's the possibility. They are either comparing one year in jail or going free today, and they would prefer to think. So if prisoner B stays silent, prisoner A would like to think or tell on the other prisoner, right? And so we put this little asterisk there. All right, the asterisk indicates um, the ideal choice or the best response, in this case, for prisoner A. So let's say prisoner B decides to think as prisoner A. You can say, well, if I think as well, I'm going to get, I'm sorry, if I stay silent and the other player tells on me or thinks, I'm going to get 20 years in the hole. If, if I think as well, I'm going to get five, and so I prefer five years to, in jail to 20 years in jail. And so I put the asterisk there. All right, and so you can see for player A, player A has a dominant strategy to think. We'll see that player B has the same dominant strategy, but let's put ourselves in the shoes of prisoner B and say, okay, well, if prisoner A stays silent, now we're in this row, and prisoner B is comparing one year in the clink to zero years in the clink and would prefer zero, and so prisoner B would think, and if prisoner A thinks, and prisoner B is comparing 20 years in the hole to 5 years in the hole and would prefer 5. 
Let's clean this up here and we'll just leave the asterisks. And if we have two players or two payoffs and we have a cell with two asterisks, that means it's a Nash equilibrium. So if you had n players and n asterisks or whatever, uh, or I don't think we're going to look at games and matrices that are beyond two players, but that would be how you'd identify, at least visually, what a Nash equilibrium would be. And in this case, there's one Nash equilibrium, and both player A and player B have dominant strategies. This is the prisoner's dilemma framed as a pollution game. And we can go through the same kind of concept, right? If we're the United States and China is the other party, the China, China and the United States can both pollute or abate. This is kind of a simplified world of, let's say, pollute is business as usual and abate is meeting the requirements of the Paris Agreement, for instance. Um, let's put ourselves in the United States' shoes. So China, uh, let's say China decides to pollute. Well, the United States is comparing payoffs. You can think of this as GDP or something like that. Um, of 50 and 25, and 50 is higher than 25. And so the United States would pollute in that case. And if China abates, the United States is comparing you know, their GDP of 100, or whatever that proxy is, and 150, and they would prefer to pollute. And so the United States has a dominant strategy to pollute. And you can see that this 150, that's the highest payout for the United States possible. And that's because it gets to free ride off the mitigation or abatement of China. Right? And so that's the strategy there is that the best case scenario is for others to do the dirty work or the expensive work of <clears throat> mitigating emissions while, the other, while you can do you know, your profit maximizing or GDP maximizing business as usual. Same thing if we put ourselves in China's shoes, the United States pollutes. China is comparing 50 and 25 and they would prefer to pollute. And if the United States abates, then China would also prefer to pollute and uh, earn that 150. And so the one cell with both asterisks is the Nash equilibrium. Both countries have dominant strategies to uh, pollute, no matter what the others do. The important thing here is that the efficient solution, the efficient outcome, right, that maximizes the net benefits or maximizes welfare is that both abate. And I know that because I'm adding up both to 200 and every other cell, the sum of both payoffs is less than 200. So the best thing for the, the, the two parties, society in this case, is to abate emissions. And the same thing in our previous game, the best case scenario for the two prisoners is to both stay silent and they both get a year in the clink or the year in jail. Uh, but the Nash equilibrium is they both get five years. And so you've got this tension between what's kind of efficient or collectively optimal with which what is individually optimal. Here's a game with two players, again, player A and B, but there's three policies. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna start as player A and see what happens. Okay, so if player B chooses policy X, and these are just generic policies, I don't know what they are, but the, the payoffs are, again, in the parentheses, and <clears throat> the higher the payoff, the better. So if player B chooses X, player A chooses Y, if player B chooses Y, player A chooses X, I'm just choosing the highest one in that column. And neither, if player B chooses neither policy, player A chooses neither policy. Okay, so we'll leave those asterisks and now we'll put ourselves in player B's shoes. And if player A chooses X and player B would like to choose X, and if player A chooses Y, player B would like to choose Y, if player A chooses neither, player B would like to choose neither. And again, this is the one and only Nash equilibrium, but it is not solved by um, a dominant strategy or the elimination of dominated strategies. And what I mean by that is that neither player has a dominant strategy. Right? Remember, dominant means that you do it no matter what. Well, it depends here, right? Player A sometimes chooses X, sometimes chooses Y, sometimes chooses neither. And so it matters. But the point is, is that neither, neither, right? If I want to write that down, that's the 
equilibrium strategy set, the payoffs are 12 and 12. And the idea is that you can check if this is a Nash, right? You, know, you go through the, the logic. Player B doesn't change their strategy, and they're choosing neither. Would player A like to, to um, change theirs? And the answer is no. Right? If you select this column, and stick to that column, right? So player B chooses neither. Player A would not like to deviate. And the same thing, if you fix it on this row and say, okay, well, player A is choosing neither, would player B like to change? And they wouldn't. But for every other possibility, policy X, policy Y, um, either one of the players or both would like to change their decision if the others kept theirs. So there's only one Nash equilibrium in this case. Let's look at one more game. It's a game of chicken. And sometimes environmental problems or treaty formation, you know, agreements between countries, are actual games of chicken or framed games of chicken. You can think of country A and country B. Well, country B doesn't show up. Country B. Again, you can think of U.S., China, whatever. And let's say their decision set is to join an agreement, you know, some sort of agreement that requires them to reduce pollution or not join an agreement, which is like business as usual. Country A and B. Again, the payoffs work as they have been. So let's put ourselves in, sorry, the shoes of country A. Country A, if, if country B joins the agreement, country A would like to not join. They'd like to kind of free ride, opt out of the agreement, and not have to kind of, you know, cooperate on emissions abatement, whatever. But if country B doesn't join the agreement, and country A would rather join the agreement than kind of see it fail. They'd rather um, mitigate emissions or cooperate on the environment um, than see it fail. But of course, they'd rather free ride on the other one doing kind of the, the heavy lifting. The same thing is going to happen here with country B. If we put ourselves in country B's shoes, country A joins. Country B would like to not join. They would like to opt out of that agreement. But if, they, if country A doesn't join, and country B would like to join. And so essentially, like the ideal situation is that someone else joins the agreement, mitigates emissions, improves the environment, and you kind of sit back and don't. But the worst case scenario would be that nobody's doing anything, which is don't join, don't join. You can tell that the efficient solution, so first off, we have two, that's why this is a good example, two Nash, equilibria. When you have more than one, it's not an equilibrium. It's an equi it's, there are equilibria. And so the two equilibria are where someone joins, the other person doesn't. But the efficient outcome is that they're both part of the agreement. All right? It's a good thing U.S. and China, you know, equilibrium would be that one of the major polluters uh, joins the agreement and, and mitigates emissions and kind of improves the environment. The other one kind of free rides on that provision. Uh, but the efficient solution is that you have both major polluters in an agreement. So these are the important concepts of game theory. And we use these tools in, in this general framework to kind of understand the strategic interaction among countries. It really started in, in the Cold War an arms race, um, you can think of between the Soviet Union and the United States. Um, but at least for economists or in the economist eyes, these games provide kind of important insights into the tensions in some of the environmental problems that can kind of highlight or, or, or motivate us to think about what policies could be implemented to help improve it.